Hello, this is Vultrafire, and it's time for another Breach Wanderers patch breakdown. So this is for uh, the Breach Wanderers release patch, part one. Uh, contrary to the name, full release will be next patch. This patch is relatively light on major features, uh, so let's just get into it. So, first thing, new generic cards. Uh, as you may guess from the fact that new generic cards is, our, is my first item here, there is, like I said, not a ton of new content. We don't have a new character. We don't have a new area. Um, but there is a lot that will be in the next patch, uh, which is very exciting. You should be looking forward to that. We are getting a new character and depth four and all sorts of other goodies in the final patch. But for now, we have 30 new generic cards. They do a variety of different things. Uh, in particular, they support the ally sacrifice theme and the le and leech as a theme, uh, both of which are decks that... Didn't really work on the last patch, but now are a lot better. I have videos coming out for both of those uh, for a couple of characters so that you can see those in action. And then just a variety of other uh, cards support other decks, so as you can see here with Extinction Focus. On top of that, we have a lot of new card art for a variety of uh, both generic and monster cards. Uh, it's a combination of cards that previously had uh, Unity assets as art uh, that have been replaced with images that will be unique to Breach Wanderers. And there's some that already had unique art that just got uh, an update to look even better. For example, Fiery Presence uh, with an amazing dragon. So moving on from that, we have Replayable Quest. So once you've completed all of the quests, you will now get the option to replay quests. Uh, this doesn't provide any special rewards, but if you, for example, uh, chose not to fight Katon on your first time through the quest, or if you chose not to fight uh, Shadowbone Natha, you can now go back through, do those quests again, and uh, try your luck and see if you can beat them the second time around. You will get the same rewards you would for just clearing a uh, a run, so uh, you don't get nothing, but you won't get any you you won't get any new cards or items or anything. It's just the same rewards you would get for doing uh, a run a normal run of that type at that depth. So let's get into new mechanics. We have two new mechanics. First one is Hollow, which you can think of as Evil Purity. Basically, the next time you would gain a buff or you would be cleansed, instead you lose a rank of hollow. Uh, I say, it says you, it's also true, like if you have hollow on, on an enemy, then the next time that enemy would gain a buff or would be cleansed, instead it loses a rank of hollow. Uh, this is the same as with purity. If you would, for example, gain mighty five, because that's one instance of gaining a buff, all of that will be negated by one rank of hollow. Um, but because cleansing is sequential if you cleanse twice that will remove two ranks of hollow because you don't cleanse two you cleanse two times um hollow does not decrease at the end of turn again it is very similar to purity it is just purity but for buffs instead of debuffs uh, right now it is very rare it appears on one generic card leeching rights and a single card that's played by idle emptiness in area three uh, so outside of those cases you will not see it yet although i would not be surprised if we see it more uh, in the next patch especially in depth four related things the other new mechanic is a lot easier to find. It's called Spell Weave. So this replaces the old increase the damage of all your spells mechanic that we used to have. Uh, instead of, for example, saying increase the damage of all your spells by 12%, you'll, you'll say gain Spell Weave 3. Each rank of Spell Weave increases the damage of all your spells by 4%. So this stacks so if you have 3 ranks, then 4 times 3 is 12. If you have 5 ranks, then 4 times 5 is 20. Um, it's additive with bonuses like Mighty or Vengeance, uh, same as any other a damage bonus, same as the old mechanic worked. The big difference is that this spell weave, because it is now a buff that you have instead of being something that is applied to your cards, spell weave will apply to card to spells that you create after you gain ranks of spell weave. And spell weave also does not decrease at the end of turn. Uh, it can be dispelled, but it mostly is just a more straightforward way to handle uh, that mechanic that we had before, uh, just more clearly. So talk about some other mechanics that have changed. First of all, ally arcane detonations. So ally detonation, arcane detonations caused by allies are now affected by items and passives that affect arcane detonation damage, such as uh, Salon's level seven and uh, the arcane torrent item that gives plus five damage to arcane detonations. Uh, this doesn't come up a ton. It basically affects uh, the crystal sprites and shadow bursts, but I think it was worth mentioning because uh, that is something that is relevant in some cases. Also, elemental barriers. So, previously, whenever you had a one of the three elemental barriers, frost, shock, or arcane barrier, uh, you would reduce the amount of status you received from attacks by two. 
Now it just inc it increases your max status of each type by two, which makes it work better with uh, self status strategies. So if you gain, so you're normally you know ten out of, or zero out of ten uh, before you've gained any status. If you gain, if you have a barrier, doesn't matter how many ranks, you'll go up to you know zero out of twelve. And if you have all three barriers, you can go up to as much as zero out of sixteen. Now, when you lose a barrier, when you lose your last rank of a barrier, that will cause your max status to decrease, but it will not ever cause a status to trigger. So if you're at 11 out of 12 arcane because you had a barrier and that barrier goes away, you will go to 9 out of 10 uh, instead of being at you know 11 out of 10 and exploding. So that's worth keeping in mind. Next up, Corrupt. So this is listed as a change, but the change is it's gone. Corrupt is no longer part of the game, just like Empower before it. It proved to be uh, more of a problem uh, than that it was. It was just difficult to make corrupt work in a way that was interesting and powerful uh, in some situations without just being overpowered in others. So cards that previously corrupted now do a variety of different things. The Malevolent Totem shows one type of thing that they do, which is that previously Malevolent Totem corrupted once on all enemies when drawn. Now it triggers curse on all enemies one time when drawn, which has a lot of the same benefit for uh, decks that were running it before, but it now loses the synergy with Doom and it isn't going to just let you get infinite stacks of weak and vulnerable and so on by with just drawing level of totems. And Pale's changed completely. You know, it is now deal 6x2 damage to the first enemy and it has 100% increased critical damage. Likewise, Wave of Corruption, now instead of corrupting, it now gives Curse uh, several times. Curse 2 and then Curse 2 again if the enemy has 3 or more debuffs and then Curse 2 a third time if the enemy has 5 or more debuffs. So uh, you will just have to look through and find all of the corrupt cards that you liked. Uh, there are patch notes that will be linked in the description. I'll talk about, I'll mention this again later. Uh, and you'll just have to see what each one does now because all of them have changed and corrupt is no more. Uh, another mechanic change, enemy summoning. So enemy summons will no longer override player summons except in very rare cases. The only case here that I'm aware of is the Thornberry captain that spawns after you trigger rebirth on the Dragonfly Rider event boss. In every other case that I'm aware of, if an enemy tries to summon and fails, uh, or if an enemy tries to summon and you have allies blocking the spots, it just will not summon. That includes Silgas, that includes Thornberry Chieftains, Thornberries, that includes even like Corrupt Paladin units, turrets. Um, they cannot summon over your allies. However, most monster actions that include summoning will now buff the monster if the summon fails. And what the exact buff is, uh, some will buff the, the enemies and some will, will debuff the player. And the exact thing that happens varies from uh, monster to monster. Uh, you know, for example, I believe the Infested Goliath boss in the Battery Ramparts uh, does not do, does not have anything if it fails to summon a Benta. Uh, but the Corrupted Paladin, you know, I'm sure whatever it does must be very nasty because, uh, you know, Corrupted Paladin starts failing to get those is a very big upside for the player, so uh, the Paladin gets something to compensate. In addition to this, player cards that summon enemies will also no longer overwrite summoned allies. So if you play, uh, for example, Forbidden Rites, which is you gain eight mana and summon a Vengeful Shade, and then you lose six mana if you fail to summon. Uh, if the board is full of allies and you cannot summon a Shade, then you will get the eight mana and then immediately lose six due to failing to summon a Shade. So. This is good news for a lot of summon fans. Uh, this makes several fights a lot less awkward uh, for playing summoning decks. You will no longer have to worry about, for example, in Ruby Dragon, having your precious turrets get just deleted instantly by Drakes. Uh, another change, Opportunist and Trigger Enemy Action. So this applies to both of them. Opportunist actions now have halved damage modifiers. So if an enemy has powerful 10, uh, it's going to boost the damage of their opportunist attack by 5 instead of 10 uh, because of that halved modifier. Several enemy opportunist attacks have been changed as part of this, which means that more monster. the, the specific thing is more monsters are going to deal damage part of their opportunist attack. Uh, this should make reflect-based strategies that are trying to, to trigger enemy actions and then get counterattack stuff more consistent. Uh, so that is something to look forward to. So, mechanic kind of changes. Treasures. Valuable Gems Treasure now gives Wits 3 mana boost 2 instead of 5 mana. This is really a pretty big nerf to treasures. Uh, it means that you can no longer just chain together treasures to get back a bunch of mana. But it does have, I mean, the treasures now have synergy with Wits and mana boost type decks. 
Uh, and then there are some other changes to treasure cards that I will talk about later. But overall, this is a nerf to your favorite treasure cards, unfortunately. But I've come to, to terms with it. I've reached the acceptance phase of, of the grieving process, I think. So next up, draft and quick play changes. Draft runs now start with three rare card picks and 12 common card picks instead of 15 common card picks. Uh, so makes draft a little bit uh, more exciting. Uh, it's a lot, little less a little less consistent. You have a little bit more variation in how those starting drafts are going to go. Um, and also in both quick play and draft mode, you can now get rares and commons after normal fights uh, instead of before you would only get commons after normal fights, which could lead to you uh, basically being uh, having your deck be almost always entirely, uh, you know, the only generic cards you would have would be commons and maybe some epics because you would just, you, you don't get that many uh, elite fights and usually you, if you went to an elite fight you were getting the elite card so uh, yeah this should make draft quick play a little bit more dynamic uh, or a little bit more varied in what you end up getting uh, should make the experience just generally better I think rush changes so idols are now distributed more consistently in rush mode uh, previously when you started a rush run with uh, idols enabled if you had more than one idol invoked you don't have all idols active in the area uh or you wouldn't and because it was just like in a normal run which means that if you were, had invoked three idols then only two would be active and they would just random which two were going to be active now boss fights are still going to be the same so you have one random idol at the mid boss if you have three idols invoked you have one random idol at the mid boss two random idols at the end boss uh with two idols invoked you have idol at the mid boss idol at the end boss but every single invoked idol is going to be active and will augment two of the non-boss fights uh, so if you have three idols active, that means it'll be a total of six idol instances across the four non-boss fights. Uh, so for example, I think it, it is, I think it is always two on the elites, two each on the two elites, and then one each on the two normal fights, but I haven't done a ton of rush, so I'm not certain about that. Uh, but this does mean that all idols invoked will always be active in at least some of the fights. Uh, you will no longer start a rush run where you have invoked, you know, Cruelty, Hunger, and Endurance, and then Hunger and Endurance are active, and you never have to deal with Cruelty at all in the entire run because it's just that's just not one of the active idols. Uh, so, if you are a if you are a Shrine Rush player, this is relevant to you. If you are not, it isn't. Next up, interchanges. So, and it got nerfed slightly. Epic and Rare tools will now be created slightly less frequently, and Inkwell and Quill's rarity has been increased to Epic from Rare. Inkwell and Quill is the tool that creates copies of another non-temporary card in your hand. Uh, so this is a bit of a nerf, but it's not too severe. Uh, and overall, it is still fantastic. But alas, uh, <laughs> inevitably, and I had to get at least something of a nerf, considering how good she's been for so long. Still is. So Keton changes. There are two passives that Keton has that have changed. The first was level one passive. First half of the level one passive is the same as it was before. You alternate between strike stance and spell stance by using strikes and spells. But the new thing is that you now heal one every time you switch stance. This may not sound like much because it is only one heal, but it actually does make a pretty big difference. Keton can end up swapping stances easily, you know, three or four times minimum, uh, and often eight or more in on particularly good turns. And so all those stance swaps now give you some healing, and that can really help offset some of the survivability problems Katon has without requiring you to commit additional cards to that survivability. You know, this will help you deal with stuff like paying for shrivels or dealing with some light bleed or just taking a bit of damage because you had to go to turn two. So overall, it just makes Katon a little bit easier to play at lower levels. Uh, the next change is not really directed to a passive, but Strike Stance now gives plus two strike damage instead of plus 30% strike damage, which means that Strike Stance is now better with... Uh, lower damage strikes for example if you have a uh, stinging strike which is you know 2x4 damage or follow-up strike which is also 2x4 damage uh, then this plus two is going to take them up to 4x4 instead of plus 30 percent which would take them to uh, 3x4 uh, so that is generally good generally an improvement for a lot of multi-hit strikes strikes tend to be relatively low base damage um, it's overall good we also got a new level 10 passive, which is draw a strike or spell from your deck every turn. So similar to how Merle's smoke bomb passive works, you will just immediately draw a strike or spell before you draw the rest of your hand for the turn. So if you only have one strike or spell, you will draw that and then draw your, your five cards. Unlike Merle's passive, this will shuffle your draw pile if needed. 
uh, which means that this can be used in particular with like increasing it, it which means that now Kiton uh, is obviously a lot stronger with decks such as increasing stab that are trying to draw the same strike every turn, same strike or spell every turn. Uh, but it also just is generally a buff to make Kato ensure that Kato will always get some action on any given turn. Uh, and that just generally makes him play a little bit more smoothly. Uh, I am a big fan of the old passive as well, but this is uh, a little bit easier to, to, to work with. And generally, I think stronger and opens up some new decks that previously uh, weren't necessarily that strong. So moving on from character changes, let's talk about card rebalancing. The only specific bit of card rebalancing that I wanted to talk about on its own is that uh, treasure generation. So cards that previously shuffled treasures into the draw pile now outright create treasures. So you see treasure hunt used to be one mana, shuffle two treasures into your draw pile. Now it is two mana, put one card on top of your deck to create two treasures. Secret cache is now gained two mana and create one treasure if this is the last card in your hand. Uh, shuffling treasures into your deck is one of those things that is pretty good early in the game, but gets wor a lot worse later because as the average quality of the card in your deck improves, the value of drawing a treasure instead goes down. Uh, you know, a treasure is a lot better than a generic common in terms of how it is costed, but it's a lot worse than an upgraded rare or, you know, a monster card from area three. So now that treasures are all create, was created in your hand, that makes them a little bit better. Uh, makes treasure hunt in particular quite a lot easier to use. Uh, treasure hunt, putting a card on top of your deck also highlights a new, I didn't list it as a new mechanic because it's not really a, like it, it doesn't have a keyword, but Putting things on top of your deck is now a thing that several cards can do. Uh, putting cards from your hand on top of your deck. And there's some neat things you can do with that. But that is going really beyond the scope of talking about treasure generation changes. Aside from that, of course, we did get a lot of other cards that changed. Uh, the cards that were underperforming got buffed, overperforming got nerfed. Same deal as always. As always, there's a link in the description uh, that will give you a full list of how each card changed. All right. Uh, Next, we have idle buffs. So there are two new idle buffs uh, that can be received from winning non-boss fights augmented by idols. Uh, summoned allied health plus 30%. Summoned allied damage dealt and status applied plus three. These are basically a nerf to idle buffs a lot of the time. If you're in an ally deck, obviously you're happy to see these. But if you aren't playing a deck that's... Because usually I would say most decks are not summoning things. If you aren't summoning things, these are pretty useless. Or if the only ally, if you're summoning allies but you don't care that much about them, you know, if you're using sprites, they're between you know six health and uh, you know eight health on a sprite is pretty minimal. They're still going to die to almost all the same things. You know maybe they start like one more burn burn tick, but and you know generally speaking, I think these are low value for a lot of decks. But you know there will be times you're happy to see them. Uh, finally, just some other random changes. Uh, got monster changes. V Vessel of Impulse was buffed slightly. Uh, Shade Berries and Red Blossoms were nerfed slightly just because they were too strong and Vessel was too weak. There's also a reduced chance of weather events. Uh, so those will be slightly less reliable than they were before, especially at higher idle counts. And then legendary cards no longer appear as rewards once picked. Uh, of course, you cannot play multiple copies of the same legendary card in the same fight. Uh, right now, there's only one legendary card. It's Legendary Strike. Uh, but... Going forward, once you have a Legendary Strike, you will no longer be offered another one during that run. Uh, so you won't even be tempted to take it. So that's it for my patch notes breakdown. Like I said, relatively uh, relatively small patch this time around. Uh, if you are interested in more details, I did not cover all of the minor changes. I didn't cover, obviously, uh, most of the card changes. And if you are curious about those, there is a link in the description that uh, I've said several times now that you can go to that will have it every single change in detail that you can consult. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Just leave a comment and I will get back to you or join the Discord. Link to the Discord in the description as well. Uh, and that's going to be it for this time. I'll see you next time. Toodles!